I'm Anthony Scaramucci, and welcome to Open Book, where I talk with some of the most interesting and brilliant minds in our world today. So joining us now on Open Book is someone I consider a friend and a patriot and a best-selling author. He's the former chief of staff for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He's a national security expert. He's written a couple of books. His recent book is called Blowback, A Warning to Save Democracy from the Next Trump. Um, Miles became very famous when he wasn't famous, of course, uh, because he had written the New York Times article under the title of Anonymous, and then he wrote a book, Anonymous, which was describing to the American people from inside the Trump administration the danger of Donald Trump. And so obviously, you know, you and I have shared that that commonality. We wanted to go work for the government and help our government serve the American people and saw things that were out of control that we both felt compelled to talk about. Uh, So obviously, you know, I admire you a great deal, Miles. This new book, A Warning to Save Democracy for the Next Trump, uh, is phenomenal. And I'm going to tell you what, An- Anonymous was great, but I love the fact that your name is on this book. And I love the fact that you are very candid about everything, including you, you yourself, which I, I heartily recommend to people, particularly young people, to read this book because it is a real basic guidebook on what to do and how to do it and how to serve your country in a patriotic way. So thank you for writing it. It takes guts to do the things that you've done. Uh, Take us back to 2018, your anonymous New York Times article. Uh, And I've heard you say in other interviews that you sort of feel like you contributed negatively by making it anonymous uh, in terms of people's trust in government. Explain that to us, Miles. Explain to us where you were in 2018 thought process there and where you are today in 2023, your thought process? Anthony, it's a great question. And I'm not going to let you interview me that way without first addressing you and how awesome you have been throughout this process. I promise I'll answer your first question. But in the spirit of being real, real and just candid and not going on shows and doing talking points, you and I had a phone conversation after the election in 2020, when I was still living in this safe house that I talk about in the book, the place I basically had to escape to as as things just got worse and worse. Um, And honestly, I did not know what I was going to do next in my life because my life had blown up. And I will never forget, it was nighttime. I was sitting on the balcony of this high rise, this totally nondescript, boring ass, horrible safe house in Northern Virginia. And the Wi-Fi signal was best on the balcony. And I had my laptop positioned in the dark and we talked from sunset until it was dark. And I think just the laptop screen was the only thing lighting up my face. And I was asking you what you thought I should do next. And you were really blunt with me. And you said, just keep telling the truth. And boy, did that stick with me because writing this book, no bullshit was really hard to do. It was hard to every day be thinking about how grim a second Trump term could be, but I felt an obligation to try to paint that picture very lucidly and not hyperbolically, but also hard to relive some of the really traumatic pieces. So I actually don't know, Anthony, if in saying that I should tell you that I hate you or that I love you for encouraging me to do that, but I think it's the latter. And so I just... I really want to, but I get it because I sometimes have self-loathing. I get it because you're saying stuff and you're like, you know, there's a weird thing going on in our society. Now people are punished for honesty and they're praised for conjecture and talking points. You know, like if you were uh, a community, if I, if you were the CEO of a publicly traded company and I was your successful communications director, not the failed one that I was in the White House. But if I was a successful one, I'd be telling you to say nothing. Go on the air. Here's your homogenized talking points. Walk off the air so that people feel you didn't say anything. Don't be offensive to anybody. Okay, but you're out there and you're explaining to people that the country is under threat. The country is under threat, not just from Donald Trump, but from a cabal of people that want to end the democracy. They don't like the rules anymore. Either 
the dem- demographics changed and it became less of a white country. And so we don't want the brown and black people to be in power. So let's change the rules or we don't like certain parts of our culture or we don't like certain people that have different sexual orientations than than ourselves or who knows you mean some of that's maybe closeted fear-based stuff that goes on i don't know what it is uh, but we reward people for not telling the truth and we hit people like you with a shotgun blast for telling the truth miles so well i'll give why you is, I'll, why I'll give is you that you think I, you know I, I'm right. First of all, do you agree with that assessment or that oh, I, I'm really? right off the mark? C- completely. So why is that? And, and well, I'll give you an answer and I'll start with an anecdote. There's a lot of fear today about being on the wrong side of your listeners or your viewers. And, and that doesn't just apply to a TV show host or a podcaster. I mean, like everyday Americans, your listeners or your viewers or your friends and your family, and there's people around you or the people watching your Snapchats or TikToks. Folks are just really terrified of getting canceled and pushed out of their tribe, whatever their tribe is. And it changes their yes. behavior. And, and I'll give you an example. And I won't say who this is because I do highly respect the person, but I was on a I was on a cable news show in the past couple of days and, uh, you know, someone who's got a left leaning show who I think felt that they, you know, even though they had me on, I'm still a former Republican. And, you know, I served in the Trump administration. So, you know, there's still got to be a zinger in there. And they came after me on Trump's reprehensible family separation policy and said, you know, you were at the Department of Homeland Security when this happened. Do you want to apologize to the families? And I'll tell you, uh, Anthony, that fucking sucked because the true story is I was one of the few people in the federal government trying to stop that policy. Uh, And in fact, I was the guy who co-wrote the executive order that we put in front of Trump to tell Jeff Sessions to go pound sand and that it was over. But a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth can put its pants on. In fact, the truth is probably still just totally asleep in the digital age, age as the as the lie laps the planet. And and I give you this example, not because anyone needs sympathy for me. Obviously, you and I going into the Trump administration, you know, people were going to say, well, therefore, the fact that you were there means you must own these policies and 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 refuse the intellectual exercise of actually digging deeper and asking, you know, what actually did you do when that thing happened? But I think people posture um, because there is a fear that if they don't do what their tribe is expecting, that they themselves will get attacked. And it leads to, I think, intellectual dishonesty. But more than anything, it leads people um, to really misrepresent their views. So let me be more specific about this. In the book, in Blowback, Mm -hmm. I talk about how there have been recent surveys that show that everyday Americans, the moderate majority, is now self-centering. Um, that people misrepresent their views in public and have very different views in private, especially on politics. What's scary to me is the cohort that doesn't do that are the political extremes, especially on the far right. People on the far right will tell you in public what they say in private. And so if we've got the majority that are moderate just shutting themselves up, then it really is definitionally the extremes driving the debate. And you pair that with studies that show that I think it's something like 75% of the conversation on Twitter was being driven by the 8% most ideological voters and social media users. Um, The stats plus or minus a few percentage points, but Jonathan Haidt cites that in one of his books. And it literally shows that the, the, the extreme elements are the ones driving the conversation and it makes it harder and harder for people to speak out. I think the only way you counter that is frankly, you just refuse to shut up. I mean, so for instance, I could have curled up in this hotel room bed yesterday that is still kind of messy after mm-hmm. that shitty cable news hit. But again, I respect the anchor. It was a good person. I think they were trying to get to a good question. But if I just let bad moments like that shut me up, well, then the other side, the MAGA guys win, because then I'm not out there talking about the dangers of a second Trump administration. So I guess that's to say in this environment, you got to kind of take the crap a little bit because it makes Mm -hmm. it that much easier for the next person to come forward and less scary for them to speak out. I, I agree. There's going to be a however, though, there is a group of people 
uh, no matter what you say or how honest you are, there's just a group of people because you work for Donald Trump. They're just going to negate you. They that, that that's part of their virtue signal. They have to uh, you work for Trump. You're definitely bad, even though you were a force for good inside the administration, even though you were pr- attempting to protect the American people. Um, uh, General Kelly is a personal friend of mine and a personal friend of yours. Uh, we don't we both know why our, our friend General Kelly left which I'd like to go into if you don't mind, but also take our listeners behind closed doors with Donald Trump and why he's not the representative of the GOP, but yet you have these jellyfish that could have put him right through the ropes after January 6th, but rather than do that, they flew down to Mar-a-Lago to do photo ops with him. What is it about his personality that scares these people? And tell us a little about General Kelly, your experience with Pompeo or a uh, Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. Um, well, and, and I'll answer that by explaining actually why I went into the administration. And hopefully this merges your first question with the second question. Mm-hmm. And yeah, please. that is, I was really opposed to Trump um, early in 2015 and, and 2016 when he emerged onto the presidential Seen, He just didn't seem like a conservative to me, didn't seem like a Republican. And, you know, I didn't want to see him be president. And in the last days of the election, I sort of frantically tried to get members of Congress that I was working with in the House of Representatives. I was a staffer at the time, tried to get them to rescind their endorsements. And I started to see inklings of the answer to your question in the responses I got as members of Congress sort of blew me off or made jokes and and none of the ones I tried to get to rescind their endorsements did, even though after the Access Hollywood tape, it seemed like there was abundant reason to distance themselves from the guy. And I couldn't figure it out. I thought, you know, at a minimum, it's going to be politically beneficial for these people to say they stood on the right side of history when Donald Trump inevitably loses. Uh, but even if he had lost, I don't think those people would have regretted not rescinding their endorsements. Why? Because they didn't want to break from the tribe and rescinding their endorsement from Trump would have made it look like they weren't a team player in the Republican party. And they would have been chided for that. And these guys value their tribal affiliation more than anything in their lives. I mean, I sincerely think in some cases they care more about their tribal affiliation with the GOP than they do the livelihoods uh, or the welfare of their families. And, And I say that because when John Kelly came onto the scene, I saw a very different attitude and he got nominated by Trump to be secretary of Homeland Security. I'd loosely known him in his time at U.S. Southern Command uh, because he'd come up and testified on Capitol Hill. We'd engaged with him and I had immense respect for him. And in those early conversations with Kelly and his transition team, it was clear he was going into the administration with a very different perspective, not trying to suck up to Donald Trump and endorse him but frankly, from a position of grave concern about whether this man was capable of being commander in chief. And at that point, I'd actually been offered several jobs in the White House. And, you know, that would have been a dream to, you know, I think back to 10 year old Miles Taylor, he would have said, what the hell are you thinking? You're not going to take a job in the White House. This is your dream. But I knew it would be career suicide to be that close to that guy. And It was obvious to everyone he was a pretty bad man. And so I didn't take the job in the White House. But when I spoke to Kelly, I thought, okay, this is a guy who legitimately wants to come in and keep the wheels on the wagon. And maybe there's a shot to do that if I'm working for him and not working for the big guy. And so I did say yes to that and went in and joined him. And, And like you, maintain immense respect for John Kelly. You know, I, I I rarely go through social media comments because people are such jackasses, but, um, you know, occasionally I do. And I don't know, not too long ago, I posted something John Kelly said, and, you know, there were people out there, how can you like general Kelly? And he enabled this guy. I'm going to tell folks right now, I don't care what your opinion is. I know the man, he's one of the most moral people I've ever met in Washington. And he threw his whole body and his career on a grenade. And troll comments like that actually justify what I just said, because yeah. he knew he would be villainized by people who would never understand why he stayed in that administration. But I sincerely think we could have gotten into a nuclear war when Donald Trump was president. That, that, that was a non-zero possibility. 
And people like Kelly being around prevented that. Now, at the end of the day, I'll be very self-critical. I think we were deluded in thinking we could keep him in check. Um, and we ended up failing at the end of the day because he just simply replaced the people who tried to keep him in check. And, and I was highly responsible for spreading that fantasy that unelected bureaucrats could protect us from Trump. I, I'm guilty as charged of that. But till my dying day, I will say people don't know the full extent of what John Kelly did to protect this country. And I just admire it immensely. Yeah. And listen, he fired me. OK, that was like his first official act was to fire me. OK, and I, you know, I was a little sore at him in the beginning. We were both a little sore. But I think once we got each other's vibe, we became very close friends. And uh, and I think that, that that's that's the important thing. If you're committed and you're a patriot and what I would say about you and John Kelly, you guys are patriots first, partisans second or maybe even partisans deep last, but you're patriots, you know, through the whole alphabet, if you will, um, down to the letter Z. Um, but well, can I say, can I, can I interject yeah. Anthony to, to throw that right back at you? But I'll say to listeners, just so they don't think I'm blowing smoke up your ass that, you know, my opinions of you were influenced, uh, by the chief, uh, you know, at first. And, and I remember the day that we swore him in, in the oval office and you were in there and, and Kellyanne and Jared and others, and and I'm pretty sure that the in fact, I, this is this is how I remember. You tell me if you remember it differently. We went into the Roosevelt room to celebrate after Trump swore him in, which was sort of funny because it was more I describe it in the book like a funeral wake and not a celebration because we were so upset at DHS to lose him. And we also knew it was going to be, a, you know, he was not looking forward to being the chief of staff to the president, or to put it lightly. But he didn't come into the Roosevelt room. And I was like, well, where the hell is he? And I'm pretty sure one of the first things he did was after he walked out of the Oval, you and him, you know, had a pull aside conversation uh, where I, I think it was discussed that that you would be leaving. And, you know, at, at, when that became public that you'd left the administration, I thought, oh, you know, here he is, you know, cleaning house of, of these Trumpers that are in there. And, and since that time, you know, this I've come to have just the most the highest opinion of you possible. You're just an exceptional patriot a family man. You're so generous, incredibly, even to your critics. Um, it's amazing. I've learned so much from you, but that's because there was a willingness to, you know, open the door back up and have conversations, which people don't do anymore. They, they don't re-engage someone that they had a character of. Um, and I think you were the one to reach out to me several years ago, uh, and I was just floored by it. Um, so anyway, th that was all, all a way of saying that. Well, I, look, I, it's I, it's I, nice you say. I mean, you know, you're, you see, you are a nice person. That's not actually what happened. He called me into his office and said, you're fired. And he said, I'm cleaning house and I need my own comms director. You're not going to be it. And he gave me my marching papers. OK, I got up and I shook his hand. I said, I totally respect that. You're the chief. Uh, he then admitted to me, which was I have to tell you, I had a lot of respect for. He said, the minute that Trump said that I was reporting directly to him. There's no way that you can have the comms director report directly to the president and not through the chief of staff. And he said, even though you're willing to do that, that wouldn't work. You would just the idea that that was in the memo. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, listen, obviously the thing I said about Bannon, which, uh, you know, I think it's one of the best things I've ever said in my life. Actually, I had, <laughs> No problem with it. You totally know, agree. To go over. This, totally is a, agree. this is a not an R-rated podcast, but I think I think it was literally one of the more legendary comments. And by the way, as General Kelly now admits to me, you know, I was right. You know, Bannon was one of the more malevolent cretins in our society. And so the thing I would say about Bannon, Miles, is that he understands and can articulate Trump's worldview because he's a He's a student of history, you know, but I, what I also say to my atheist friends out there, if you don't believe in God, you should. And let me provide evidence why there is a God, because Bannon is smart. He's charismatic. He's well read. He has a malevolent worldview that Trump shares. But God made Steve so ugly. Okay, he made him so ugly. 
that we don't take him seriously. Thank God, right? You know, he looks like you know he's he's he he's he's got the rosacea of an alcoholic, and he dresses in contemporary hobo. Okay, thank God. You know, so hobo chic. Thank God, I think it's for, hobo chic. Know, yeah, hobo chic. You have to thank God for that. So, but go to these guys in your book. Go to McCarthy, Pompeo. Go to the Republicans in the book. What has you torqued up or not torqued up about those guys? Um, it's not personal for me anymore. It was for a period. There was a period of time where I felt deeply personally let down by these people. The Again, the McCarthy's and the Pompeo's who I witnessed in private express very candidly their views of the former president. They're very negative views of the former president, the things that we all know to be true. I mean, I don't even need to catalog what they thought because they just thought what we all thought. It's, it's he's, he's an observably stupid, unhinged person. And anyone who can't see that is clearly trying to get something and has some kind of agenda. I mean, genuinely, I've yet to meet the person that's in our political system in the Republican Party who really authentically admires Donald Trump. I, I don't know who that is. I And, and there is no actual mega MAGA. There's just mega climbers and and the people who, you know, keep their opinions uh, to themselves and hope they won't draw his ire. And so it was I, a lot of personal disappointment in folks like that that I looked up to. Um, and now it's just. I feel like I've got to find the people who are willing to be flipped because they are so, so valuable. I do yeah. think that I'll give you an example. Another person who I didn't used to be friends with, and now I just think the world of is Stephanie Grisham. You know, Stephanie yeah. made my life a living hell when she was press yeah. secretary and coming out against me when I was criticizing the president and all yeah, that. She stuff. went after me. She went after me, too. Yeah. But you know what? When she turned on Trump, I thought this is such a gift because she's such a credible messenger. She was in the MAGA movement. She was at least a true believer in the populism. She may not have been a true believer that Donald Trump was a man of character. And uh, and now she's really seen the ugly underbelly of it and she can go message to those communities. And I think people like Stephanie helped folks break away from the tribe and are useful messengers. So that's where my focus is now is trying to find those Republicans who I know have an opinion in private that they might be willing to express in public and try to lower that cost for them. Some of those people you mentioned, I, you know, I don't, I don't think Kevin McCarthy, I don't think it'll ever happen, sadly. Um, yeah. I, you know, mm -hmm. I saw some inklings of it with Pompeo recently and, and it's sad to me because I, I personally had just, I gotta tell you, I mean, at one point I told Mike Pompeo that I thought he should be president of the United States before Donald Trump was elected. I mean, you know, he was, a, he was, a, yeah. no one knew him as a, a member gifted of the guy. I was like, you, he are like the Tony Soprano of politics, but with a moral code. I just freaking loved Pompeo. And, you know, he was a sophomore congressman and, and I was a junior staffer. And I was just like, you are the guy, like, let's get you there and wanted to help him angle into good chairmanships mm -hmm. and a future in the party. But then to watch him as secretary of state, know these same things that I knew and be in a more important position, a vastly more important position than me and have a microphone and not then use that to tell people the truth about the danger in the Oval Office. Uh, that was a, that was a deeply disappointing thing, and I continue to be disappointed. But I'm not taking it so personally anymore. I'm more focused on okay, who can who can we get to actually speak the truth, and and how do we make it easier for them to speak the truth? And we and we agree, and I like Mike a lot, but I do think that but uh, but he falls into the category of many of them. So. What do you think of this current crop of presidential candidates and the 2024 primary season? And if you don't mind, make a prediction for us. Um, it actually is mixed because I am starting to see more criticism of Trump than I expected. I had a pretty grim view going in. I didn't think there would be any candidates outside of, you know, people who don't have a shot that would be criticizing Trump. But, um, and Chris Christie may not have a shot, but we've seen the Christies, thankfully, just go full bore against Trump. And Christie, like a lot of us, is not undeserving of criticism. I mean, he really, really lent legitimacy to Donald Trump from the get go and all the way through. 
Uh, but you know what? It's never too late to do the right thing. And I firmly re- believe in redemption. And by God, you know, day by day, Christy is slowly redeeming himself in my eyes by going out there and being really blunt about Trump. And I actually will say it's more courageous than folks realize because Christie is going in front of these audiences that are really conservative. You know, uh, he's going and standing in front of these folks that really, really love Trump. And he's telling them that Donald Trump uh, is a psychopath. And, and that takes some guts. But we need more people doing that. So, look, if I had to make a prediction about the field and, I, and I'm going to paint a pessimistic picture right now, um, I think Donald Trump, despite another indictment uh, that is imminent, will be uh, the GOP nominee. I think he will be the GOP nominee. I don't think anything's going to change with Biden being on the ticket. You're going to have probably the most restless electorate you've ever seen in recent history. And that's saying something, given what we went through in 2016 and 2020. And then the no labels team is going to come out and offer a unity ticket that is really going to muck it up in unforeseeable ways. Um, And potentially, if they don't do that right, and if they don't and if they're not very cautious, could give Donald Trump a fast pass back into the Oval Office while there are cases uh, proceeding against him. And then we are in constitutionally uncharted territory because there's not a person on this earth that doesn't think that Donald Trump wouldn't pardon himself if he became president. And that, of course, would be challenged by the courts. But we don't know what hap- would happen there. And I've asked the best constitutional scholars about that. And essentially, their answer is a big question mark. And the fact that there isn't a clear resolution to that does mean constitutional crisis by definition. So we're not too many hops away from a possible massive constitutional crisis, but um, but I will still hold out a little hope that one of these candidates opposed to him, Tim Scott or Chris Christie, will break out and be able to suppress Donald Trump's numbers in the primary states enough that the field can coalesce around them instead of him. It's incredibly well phrased, and you are unfortunately likely to be right. So he is going to go through these trials and tribulations. He is the nominee. Do you think he can win it? Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it. I think if, uh, I think today, if it was just Trump versus Biden, I think Donald Trump wins. And certainly that's the last thing that I want to see. I mean, I just wrote a whole damn book trying to paint a picture of how bad a second term would be to convince people not to make that mistake. But I think that Democrats are highly unmotivated about Joe Biden um, and they can get mad at me. But the numbers show it that um, a majority of Biden's voters are really, really unmotivated about his candidacy, I think, at the highest levels we've ever seen for an incumbent. And a lot of the Republicans who defected from the GOP to support Biden, which just helped put him over the edge, the polls show a lot of them have gone back to the tribe. So Biden can't count on. Uh, as many independents as he had before or as many conservatives as he had before uh, come in, you know, coalition with him. And that really cuts in Trump's favor. And it's remarkable to think after everything that Trump uh, has that possibility. But um, I think there's a real chance. And the betting markets don't totally agree with me. The betting markets still give Biden an edge right now, but not as much of an edge as you'd want. I mean, the other day I looked and I think the, the odds makers gave Joe Biden a 38 percent chance of being the next president and Donald Trump a 32 percent chance. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's almost oh, no. a coin flip. Um, and and, no, and I one think of you're right. If they bring in a third Biden. party, it'll hurt. If they bring in a third party, Miles, it'll hurt Biden more than Trump, don't you think? Yeah. And look, yeah. Anthony, you know this about me. I'm a real believer, actually, in third parties and competition in our democracy. I really hope in this century, and maybe it won't be until I'm retirement age, that we'll see a competitive multi-party democracy where there are many factions and there are more moderate parties and the Democrats are still there and the Republicans, and and we have more choice and competition. That will require a lot of democracy reform. But in this moment, a third party ticket, all else being equal, looks like it could spoil the election for Donald Trump and put him back mm-hmm. in the White House, which is a, a, a very scary prospect to me. So I hope yeah, to- people who are considering that are at least thinking about talking to the White House first and seeing if there's a way uh, mm-hmm. to do some kind of uh, negotiation before they enter into the fray. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go to the personal side for a second. Um, 
you know, we both experienced some personal struggles uh, coming out of the trauma. I mean, I got almost got Deirdre and I almost got divorced. Thankfully, we were able to pack, patch it up. Uh, it, it impacted my business. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, again, you don't get rewarded for telling the truth. People like Trump, they'll fire me. People that hated the fact that I was with Trump in the first place, they'll fire me. You know, this is the way it works. Um, but, uh, you know, we both had some struggles. Tell us a little bit about your struggles. You've had to hire bodyguards. You've moved locations. Uh, give us a sense for the personal toll honesty has. Well, you have experienced this as much or, or, or more than me, Anthony, and I'm glad that you flagged what you've gone through because, you know, sometimes people will villainize you or I and say uh, there's this magic word that's called grifters. And they'll say yes. you're grifters. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I always find it, um, I understand the inclination for people to do that because they, when they see you on television, they assume that being on television means you're just making a ton of money and you must be raking it in. Uh, and I really wish some of those people that level the accusation had been sitting there with me in a dingy apartment filing for unemployment in the months after I left the Trump administration. And I'm not embarrassed to say it. I think some people are embarrassed to say when they've been on welfare. I mean, you know, when I was younger, we had some tough times as a family. And uh, and after the Trump administration, you know, I did. I, I, I laid out for people, not for sympathy, but for clarity that, yeah, I lost my home and I lost my job and I lost the relationship that I was in and, and my personal security. And I had to blow my savings on lawyers and uh, and, and protective measures, everything was detonated. And any one of those things is enough to push someone into a pretty dark place. And, and I had them all happen at once. And uh, unsurprisingly, it did. It put me into a pretty dark place. And I developed an addiction to alcohol to cope with it and pills. And I did all of the things that you think are like bad movie tropes that I never would have imagined would happen but I just needed to turn off reality because my reality became so barren after coming out against Trump because our political environment, the political intimidation and violence and discourse is so overwhelming, it just enveloped my life. And it wasn't just from the right. I mean, it was mostly from the far right, but in total candor, some of the people who individually were cruelest to me were people who had said they really wanted people to break out of Trump's orbit and oppose him. And then when right. some of us did, they savaged us and said, yeah. why didn't you do it sooner? Where the hell were you? Why did you go in? I mean, they kind of lumped everyone into a MAGA camp together. Right. And no one, but no one bothered to ask, did you even vote for Donald Trump? You know, I didn't vote even for Donald Trump, but you know, you get lumped into that camp and some of those people, and, right. and I, 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 I don't need to name them, but really made life exceptionally difficult. So, Longer answer than you asked for, but staying in politics is the least financially beneficial decision I've ever made in my life. It's yeah, so detrimental. I appreciate the answer to career. so much because I appreciate the answer so much because it's uh, it's so honest. And you know, and obviously, I share and have empathy for you because I, a lot of it has happened to me. I guess uh, my thing that I tell people philosophically: you don't go into the NFL, put the helmet on, wear the jersey. And expect not to get a concussion, okay? Because you know you're, you're on the battlefield, you're going to get hurt, you know. And that's that's you and me, okay? Yeah. So I I, I uh, love your book. Um, you got a new podcast. It's called The Whistleblowers Inside the uh, Trump Administration. Tell us about your new podcast. Yeah, I'm excited about this. Um, and again, lest anyone be confused on the grifter label, <laughs> neither of these projects has paid me very much money. In fact, neither is sufficient enough to pay the bills. So, you know, I, I have a day job working on uh, nonprofit think tank stuff in Washington, D.C. But um, I, I was really flattered to get asked to do this pod is um, iHeartRadio wanted to do a series about people who spoke out inside of government and they asked if I'd be willing to host it. And uh, the honest story is I said, you know, I don't want to just read the prompts. I don't just want to be a radio mm -hmm. voice. I want to help you go find these people and tell the stories. And so we went and spoke to a whole bunch of folks all across the Trump administration, people that were lifelong Republicans to people who were just apolitical public servants who somewhere in those years blew the whistle either about presidential misconduct 
or wrongdoing inside of an agency. And it was fascinating to me. It was fascinating to me because not only were these stories harrowing and gripping and emotional, but Anthony, I asked every one of these whistleblowers we spoke to at the end that whether they regretted it after detonating their lives, did they regret it? And not a single person told me they did. Now they may have said they would have done some things differently, but they all said they still would have blown the whistle. And it's hard to find things these days that are inspiring and uplifting. And uh, that gave me a much needed boost. And, and back to your earlier point, no one has to have sympathy for me. Like you, I went into the political arena wide eyed. I knew I would take punches and life's been good since then. I, I found and married the love of my life. I'm 18 months sober. Um, but the thing that I would say is we need to really protect those people in our society who don't expect that they're going to enter mm -hmm. that gladiator arena. And we've got a lot of brave public servants around the country, all the way to the local level, you know, people who stood up against the electoral coup, um, who never expected to be in the fray like that and took some really brutal punches. And that would just be my one exhortation to your listeners is when you see those people getting attacked and experiencing the crowdsourced intimidation, come to their defense because they need well it. They didn't sign up for this. All right, so I'm, I'm down to the part of the podcast where I, I read out my five words. After I read somebody's book, I think about some of these things, put it together. I need you to respond to these five words. And then you you know, you know can put a paragraph, a word, whatever you think. Okay, start with word number one, Biden. I'm, I'm thinking about this one. Um, at risk of losing. Democracy. At risk of losing. Trump. <laughs> I, I wish I gave the same answer. At, at, at um, risk of winning, right? Big, no. <laughs> biggest, biggest loser. Um, you, you know, threat, fundamental threat to democracy as we know it. Yeah, but also, but also a symbol of something gone wrong in the country because he is an avatar. He represents a very large group of people. He, and he really a, does. And, and, yeah. and I don't have anything yeah. against those people. I've got extended family no. members who are MAGA no. voters and friends who are so frustrated with Washington. But um, I think they're being duped. I know they're being duped by a guy who says he's going to be their retribution. And all he's actually saying is, elect me so I can go get retribution for myself. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I only care about my, I only care. He only cares about himself. His yep. message is I only care about myself. MAGA, the concept MAGA. Populism. Mm -hmm. 2024. A year of reckoning. I think that next year, will be the most important year for our democracy of any since I've been alive. Uh, I'm approaching the back half of my 30s, and we've been through some times of turmoil. Uh, Anthony, you know, you were there in New York on 9-11. We all witnessed those years together after the fact. That felt like it was going to be the watershed moment for democracy is how we responded to that. We saw what happened with Trump's rise, we saw his presidency. I think all of it will pale in comparison to the moment of decision we have next year, which if it is Trump versus Biden, is the most black and white choice we've ever had in the modern history of the Republic about whether to keep democracy alive or whether to uh, roll it up and throw it away. I think that's really what next year will come down to if we continue on this path. I, so, so well said. Uh, the title of your book is Blowback, A Warning to Save Democracy from the Next Trump. It's got everything that you would expect to have in a book about our current political zeitgeist. Your personal observations and your personal stories are amazing. And uh, your descriptions of the people are great. So uh, I enjoyed the book a great deal. And uh, I uh, really appreciate you coming on Open Book. Well, and, and I appreciate you talking to me for it. I think some of the punchiest quotes in the entire tome are Anthony Scaramucci quotes. So <laughs> you were very gracious to give me your time and insight about why we're in this place we're in. So, uh, Anthony, thank you. And well, I appreciate you, you including me, but, it, you know, it, 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 it was it was fun to do those interviews with you. 
Well, I'm grateful for you, brother. And uh, yeah, thanks for what you continue to do.